we get to choose what we dwell on and we get to choose our actions. We're not primates, okay? We don't have to act on all of our impulses, even though it seems like we do. Um, so let's figure out how to honor God with our minds and our bodies. And if we keep coming back to like this idea that God wants to use us as co-laborers, he wants us to use his authority and his power to put the world back to rights, then you can start to see why it's so important to take back control of our minds and our bodies. If we stay weakened here, we cannot fulfill that which God has called us to. So something that we take for granted, because many of us have heard it thousands of times, is the first and greatest commandment in the Bible. And it says, love your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So think about this. We are children of the Most High God. We are sons and daughters, kings and queens of the living God. And sin is so far beneath us, so far beneath who God made us to be. So like church, it's like it's time to rise up to take the place that God intended for us, which is holy and blameless in his sight. We are not primates. We are children of God. Okay, so what does it mean to take authority? This doesn't mean that we all of a sudden have the, the magic powers to go abracadabra, poof. You know, like all of a sudden we get to do whatever we want and we're God. It doesn't mean that. And then work out your faith. This idea of working out our faith, it happens over time by practicing and trusting God. So practice, practice, practice putting in the things of God. So one of the reasons we at Stone Coast do a lot of life application teaching is because I definitely want all of us to be putting into practice what the Bible teaches. Now, it's great to have intellectual stimulation from time to time with the scriptures and we learn different things, but it's useless if we don't live it out. The scriptures were meant for us to not just hear it, but to do it and to live it. Okay, so a lot of us were told, um, like, the, the thing WWJD, most of you heard that, like what would Jesus do? And I used to add a little bit to it. I was like, um, what would Jesus do if he were me in this situation, in, in this time, right? Like in 2020 um, and with my personality, with my gifts, etc. And I love that question. I, I do. I think it's something that is very, very helpful to ask in a lot of different situations. But I also really appreciated Greg Boyd was, was saying, well, all right, I get that, but here's another four letters, H-D-J-T. And he said, how did Jesus train? And I thought about that and I was like, that's a very, very important distinction because we, we think that we can be in a situation that's tempting and then say, what would Jesus do and be successful? And I'm telling you, if you're in the moment, you're probably not gonna be successful. So the, a really great question to first ask is how did Jesus train? Because we need to take on a training regimen that will then allow us to be able to, when the temptation comes, be able to defeat it, okay? So Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Son, though he was, talking about Jesus, he learned obedience from what he suffered, okay? Think about that. He learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. I found that verse, to, like, I was like, I don't recall seeing that verse. And I was like, whoa. Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. So I put this, how did Jesus learn obedience? By memorizing scripture, by spending time in a small group, by serving others, by praying, like, no, those are all great things and we should all do that. But how he learned it was through obedience and through what he suffered, okay? So he learned obedience from what he suffered. When we go through difficult times in our lives, when we have sin that keeps rearing its ugly head, these are opportunities for us to learn obedience. And Brian, this goes back to, we're gonna talk a little bit about what you brought up to me a week and a half ago about um, does God let us go through difficult times in order to, to mature us, okay? So this is gonna be interesting. If life were always easy and always blessed and always good, then we would never learn what it truly means to follow Jesus. We would never learn what it means to learn how to have authority 
and to overcome evil and sin. Because that is what's present in this world. So we have to learn how to overcome the evil one. It's through the hard times that we are able to learn and grow and become more what God intended. Okay, so I put under this thing about like when we suffer, okay, think about this. When we suffer, it's important to know the scriptures, to know what it says about God and his nature, what we've talked about the last couple of weeks, to know that God is good and he is loving, but that his creation has fallen. When we suffer, now we realize the importance of Christian community and of safe friends. When we suffer, we see the value of serving others. It's in that time of suffering when that happens. When we suffer, we realize the necessity of prayer. And we get, begin to learn more and more about authority and being a co-laborer with Christ. This isn't easy to get to, okay? So I call these competing truths. And for most of us, we don't, uh, it's not easy for us to hold two competing truths in our minds at the same time, okay? But I'm gonna try to encourage you to do this. So a couple of weeks ago, I said to you that God's in control and doesn't inflict suffering. Okay, so that, Brian, this is what we were talking about. So if God's in control and he's all powerful, but we talked about like he's not the one inflicting suffering because he's not up there as this mean God who's pushing the buttons, right? And saying, okay, you get zapped with cancer and you don't and you get molested and you don't, right? We talked all about that. So I believe that's true. So that's one truth, okay? And the second truth is sometimes he allows us to suffer, to learn and to grow. I want you to hold both of those thoughts. They're both true. And that's hard for us. Brian, you hear that as far as like when we were talking about that, this idea that um, you were saying to me that, like, you, you know what I mean? You said, I think that sometimes God allows us to go through things and sometimes the hard things because he's trying to grow us or to mature us and, and or to teach us certain things, right? And I was like, so that, that was juxtaposed about this other thing. Like sometimes, well, if God's, if God does that, then that, does that mean he's doing all these awful, harmful things, you know? And so I feel like this is uh, part of the answer, at least, to say like this, this is a, a both and and not an either or. And I think as human beings, sometimes we, we um, it makes us feel better when we have the black and the white and it's one truth at a time. And it's simply just because we're, we're not wired to be able to hold two competing truths at the same time. So I'm going to go on into why what you were talking to me about is very, um, very much needed. Okay, so we do need to go through it. If you have to put it in the microphone, just so it gets heard. Terry, microphone? It's in your pocket, maybe? No? I was just going to say, I think the, I think the, the word that changes that, change, that frames it better is cause. Like, yep. it's not only allow, but cause. Like, does he cause? Does he cause certain things? Yeah, I purposely and also said allow. it the way I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right, right? Because causing and allowing is different. Um, and I don't know. I, I don't know that he causes it as much as he allows it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think, like, I think that's where our trust, Brian was saying, like, where is that line drawn? And I think, again, as humans, we want it to make sense to us where we don't really understand the mystery of God and, and why he allows these things to happen or not. And I, I think one, one time I was talking about him as the master chess player. Like, and he, he know, we know the outcome, right? But there's a hundred different moves that can be played in between. And as long as I know the outcome, um, I can allow you to go through something because I know this is going to help you in the long run, right? And, and to me, that would still be a loving act. If I just did it to you just to inflict it on you and say, ah, just deal with it, right? And there's no purpose behind it. There's no intention behind it. It's not going to grow you into understanding your authority, to understand your power that God has for you to be a co-laborer. Then I would say that that's that part of God that would be like, oh, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with, right? But when you see he's refining you, like that pruning process that we talked about, I think that's where, to me at least, makes a lot more sense when I see it that way, that um, I'm learning power. I'm learning authority so that I don't abuse his power, all right? Um, and so if we look to Jesus as our example, he, he practiced the spiritual disciplines. 
All right, so I'm going to read that same verse again from Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. It says, Son, though he was, right, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And I want us to think about this, became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. To me, when I hear Jesus became, this infers that he didn't start off this way. Hmm. That he had to suffer. That he had to learn. He had to overcome. So a question to all of you out there. What do you think about this verse and the notion that Jesus, quote unquote, became over time the source of eternal salvation? So I think that's fascinating. So think about that. Like maybe when he was seven, he wasn't ready. When he was 12, maybe he wasn't ready. When he was 15, maybe he wasn't ready. Like maybe he had to go through life. And, and what I love about this is that we have to see that he was fully human, right? We, we know that he was fully divine, but he was also fully human. So perhaps he had to go through life and understand suffering. And I love the story of when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was tempted for 40 days. So the enemy was there and was tempting him, right? And, and Jesus, to me, it, it says in that scripture that the spirit of God led him there. So Brian, this is like this idea that maybe talk about, like in this instance with Jesus, it says the spirit led him there. Cause, allow, you know, so, um, and I think this was a training opportunity. I, I think you, you know the cross is coming, but in my humanity, Jesus, right, and his humanity is preparing himself to take on the whole thing, all of man's sin, all of the evil, right? And so first, maybe he had to learn authority and power in the wilderness, and as he overcame that, as he overcame the evil one there, he was then able to then go to the cross to overcome him for good. Uh, just a fascinating thing to think about. Okay? Um, Jesus became the source of eternal salvation for all who believe in him. No, it doesn't say that. Right? He says it became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. I can't say that enough. Like, it's not about a belief as much as we might think it is. It's about obeying him. So let's look at the value of obedience, okay? So in order to be an authority, we must cultivate spiritual practices. All right, and there's a sports analogy for you. So a lot of times in life, we see people's highlight reels, like even on Facebook, right? Like I, I have a love-hate relationship with, with Facebook. It's like, we put on there a facade. Like, here's our highlight reel. Here's all our great moments in God. Here's our, all our great moments in life. And, and then we, like other people look at that and say, oh, that's a super Christian, or that's a super mom, or that's a super dad, or whatever, right? Super employee. And, and all we see is the, the glory of it, the highlight reel. 